coming up on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. We're going to talk about growing grape garlic. As well as five mistakes all or most new canners make. And Donna Blazer, author, horticulturist, speaker, and she, her motto is No Guff Gardens. All that in your garden questions and our garden answers. Garden radios on the air and it all starts right now. You're tuned in to the only vegetable gardening radio show in Milwaukee with your host, Joey Baird, who grew up in the country but now lives closer to the city, and Holly Baird, who has always been a city girl. Combined, they have over 25 years of gardening experience who believe in simple gardening practices. A gardener for all gardeners, founders of the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, where they created over 800 how-to garden videos to teach others how to grow more of what they eat. Join them for the next hour as they discuss vegetable gardening and more. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show on 860 AM WNLV and W293CX 106.5. Wherever you may be listening, however you may be listening, whether through those particular stations, the TuneIn app, the Simple Radio app, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, Radio Tab, or anywhere in between. We are live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. Dot com is your destination for all things gardening with over 1,000 garden videos to help you and for your enjoyment pleasure. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner. Holly Baird. This program is made possible by the great sponsors you'll hear throughout the program, as well as... Nasala Kombucha is the sponsor of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show. Nasala is made in Wisconsin with local tea and natural herbs. Look for it in the refrigerator aisle at your local grocer. If you don't see it, ask for it because if it's not Ness Alley Kombucha, it's not kombucha. Find out more at nessalad.com. And there's a number of ways in which you can contact us through the program, during the show, and even after the show. You can always send us an email at twvgradio at gmail.com. You can tweet us at hashtag twvg. Or you can also call us during the show on the Ivy Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard Hotline. Ivy Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents. Protects newly installed plants and trees for use on your roses, fruit, and nut trees. Shields pruned and damaged surfaces, ornamental trees, and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, visit ivyorganics.com. You can call with your question or comment to 414-444-5250. And that's uh, 414-444-5250. You don't have to wait to the end of the program to do such. If you've got a question, you can certainly call in right now. Well, it's it feels like it's the late October when it's really just the beginning of September here with the outdoor temperatures. So we need to start thinking about fall planting of a very important crop. We're going to talk about growing great garlic. Now, growing garlic is something that, you know, when we do talk, people are like, what, garlic is just this incredibly hard crop to grow, and, you know, it's the easiest crop that we can potentially put in the ground. It's what you call the lazy man's gardener's crop. Definitely. It's, uh, we ha- and we had some difficulty. We, we so, made a lot of mistakes, right. yeah. Um, so it's not like we started growing great garlic right off the bat. Um, uh, we, we had two years of failures. Mm-hmm. Then we got a hold of Mark Brown, who's the curator of the St. Louis Garlic Festival, who grows about 20,000 bulbs of garlic a year. We said, here's what we're doing. And he said, here's what you're doing wrong. And ever since then, we've had very good garlic here in, in, Milwaukee, in the Milwaukee area. Right. So it does, um, it does take nine months to grow. Now there is spring garlic, but we're going to talk about how we grow our garlic, which is the fall garlic. So you want to put that in... The ground here in the Milwaukee area, the um, first Saturday, the first in, Saturday of, in October is yeah. when we put ours. In. Again, nine months, so you're going to dedicate this spot for a very long period of time. So there is some things you can intercrop in with them, but we're going to focus on the, the garlic itself. So you're going to put it in the first week in October. Now let's talk about what type of garlic we want to plant because we just don't want to go to the grocery store, which we did years ago, buy it, plant it, and it didn't do well. That was our mistake. You want to buy good actual heirloom variety garlic. The garlic you get at the grocery store, if it's just the generic brand on the shelf, a lot of that has come from Asia and is hydroponically grown or grown in the situation of producing uh, for quantity instead of quality. Basically, it's probably not going to regrow. It's a generic generic garlic. Right. 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 So we get ours from um, Copper Kettle Farm 
and they are out um, in Colgate. In Colgate, which is just kind of by the by the Menominee Falls, a little bit. Um, now you don't have to get it there. from there. No, you don't. But um, you can get at farmers markets if you know somebody who grows garlic, and or you just you don't find want, it online. Right. You don't. If you're going to buy it online, that's great. That's fine. You just don't want to buy it. You want to try to stay regional. You don't want to buy garlic that's being sold from a producer in Phoenix, Arizona, because it's not going to grow right here in the Milwaukee area or anywhere wherever you're listening. You want to buy it from the area in which you're intending to grow it or at least regionally. So there's two different types of garlic. There's hard neck garlic and soft neck garlic. Right. And so in Wisconsin, hard neck seems to to do the best. Yeah, that's what we've recommended. That's what our supplier recommends. You can grow soft neck. There is some challenges with soft neck. And the difference between the two here are simply this. Hard neck, the stem, if you would cut the bulb completely top to bottom, the stem goes all the way through the bulb. Soft neck, the stem does not go all the way through the actual garlic bulb. So that's the and difference. If, and if you, are, if you are familiar with what garlic scapes are, hard neck gets you the garlic scapes. Yes, and the uh, one stores better than the other, but uh, we find that the hard neck works great. And hard neck also has more flavor. And it's heartier for... Well, I- anytime you buy good actual garlic or you grow your actual garlic, Uh, only use about a quarter of what you normally would use in a dish. Not because it's spicy hot, but because the intensive flavor is so much stronger than the the, the generic stuff that we're used to in the grocery store. So we... uh, Okay, so now we have our... Let's talk about one other... There's another garlic that people go, what about elephant garlic? What about elephant garlic? So elephant garlic is technically related to the leek family, which is then the onion family. So it's not technically garlic and you grow that elephant garlic as you would a bulbing onion you plant it in the spring you harvest it in the fall it has a garlic flavor yes and it has very large bulbs or cloves in that bulb so if you don't like peeling garlic or you have uh issues with your hands that you can't peel it very well that would be the the way i would go but you can get you know they'll, they'll get almost tennis ball size right. baseball size uh, bulbs there so we want to plant you want to get good loose fertile soil and you don't have to put this in your garden. You can throw this in a, in a flower bed because, you know, does, you don't need much space. No, and you can you can do um, in the ground. You can yeah. do in raised beds. People will do this in containers. This is not something we recommend, but it can be done successfully in containers in Wisconsin. We just find it's way, way less maintenance. And, and as gardeners, we want to get the most out for the least amount of work we can do. Garlic in the ground is the way to go about doing that. But if you have no ground, then you can do containers, and there's some great articles online which instruct you on how to do that uh, successfully. Okay, so we talked about hard Let, Let's talk about where we want to right, plant. So you want to put this where it's in full sun, well-draining soil, and not a low area. So we had that really wet spring, and a lot of people had difficulties with their garlic because they planted it in a low-lying area. Now, you might not think, okay, my, garlic, my gar- garden seems pretty flat, but if, if you, you lay on your stomach and look at the terrain of your garden, you will see the yeah, clothes and ups and downs see, yes. of where, and it's amazing how much a little water will puddle in an area and set there uh, and not drain very well. So you want to, and again, look up where you're going to plant this because just because... Especially right now. It, there's trees above us. Right. And, and in the, uh, by the time you plant, some of the leaves may have fell off if you're first, second, third week in October uh, based on what your time frame is. And in the spring, that tree is going to reestablish itself, and you're going to be in a shady area. They do grow somewhat in shade area, but you're going to do far, far better if you're in full sun. So you have to work with what you got. Right. I know you, you, can, you don't want to be cutting trees down, but you want to use what you got. Definitely. So you want to consider where you're planting it. And as Joey had mentioned before, you're committing to that spot for about nine months, so you, you're not in the spring. You're not going to be able to use that spot. You could intercrop like radishes or lettuce or something like that. But right, but yeah, it's but not going to be. Um, it's not. You're not going to throw tomatoes in no. or zucchini or anything like that. So we got. We know where we want to plant it now. Um, one thing you can do. Let's talk about how to get the the actual seed or the the bulb and what's the difference here. The bulb is. You want to break the bulb apart to, to find to the cloves. The cloves. Mm-hmm. You don't want to plant seeds because seeds will take almost two years to get to a bulb-like stage. So you want to take that clove, the largest clove of cloves of it. All the cloves will grow. But the larger the clove, the better opportunity at the end of the season, you're going to have large bulbs that you're going to be able to harvest. 
So you want to do that, and you want to plant it in the same direction that you pulled it off of the actual bulb. Put it about two to four inches deep, 12 inches apart at max. Uh, we go somewhere between eight and nine because we've learned that you can cram these in a little tighter in a row, and then row spacing no more than 18 inches apart. We will go 12 inches apart because some of these garlic will grow three and a half foot tall and span out a foot and a half to two foot. They get very large. Right. So... That's uh, what. That's how you want to plant them, and you before you plant them, you can soak them. You don't have to, but you can soak them in water or compost tea. And the reason why you want to, or we would recommend soaking them, is you're planting them in the fall for the roots to get established. Then the plant's going to go into dormancy and then come back as soon as the first warmth of spring occurs in the soil. So by soaking them, you're going to energize the internal mechanisms inside that clove in order to put roots on. You're going to have some top growth, yes, based on how long from the time of planting to the first hard freeze or, uh, you have, you're going to have some top growth. That's totally fine. Nothing wrong with that. Now, some people will mulch their garlic at the time. Right. I was going to mention yeah. this. So if you're going to mulch your garlic, <coughs> excuse me, you want to make sure you're not putting like, you know, a foot or more of mulch on there. You want just a few inches. Right. We don't mulch ours, and we haven't mulched ours ever and it, it does fine so that's something that you want to keep in mind is that you don't have to mulch it you are going to see it sprout before uh winter and you might think oh i'm what's going to happen if i don't mulch it it's going to be okay now you can mulch it and uh, and then in the spring pull that mulch back so these plants can get pushed through that mulch uh, dry grass clippings which you may th- those are dissipate straw is the best mulch if you're going to go that way shredded leaves but again some people feel that putting that mulch on top of the, the the seed bed will insulate that garlic and help it a little bit. Again, we've had some harsh winters, and our garlic has done fine. So it's a personal preference. If you want to, pr- you know, think... If well, you do you want to mulch. Only do a part of it and, yeah. and experiment. because Or then, just don't put, a, like, a foot of mulch on it. Just do, you know, a couple inches at most. Right. And then in the spring, you're not fertilizing in the fall. In the spring, you're going to add some fertilizer, whether it's a compost, just sprinkle it on top and let the water from rain push it down in the ground, some type of all-natural fertilizer, something that to just give it an extra little energy boost in the spring so you can go ahead and get that to uh, begin to grow. And this will begin to rapidly uh, sprout up uh, as the temperatures warm. You're going to, and what we're talking about hard neck, we're going to talk about scapes. On the soft neck, you're not going to harvest it until the tops fall over. Mm-hmm. That's your indication of when to harvest it. The plant's going to die. Top just like over. an onion. Yeah, just like an onion. With hard neck garlic, you're going to have a couple of stages in which you'll know what steps to take here. First, you will start to see what is going to be a hook-like growth on the top of the plant coming out of the center stalk. And it has like a little bulb type of thing, like a little notch in that hook-like top. And you can you can Google garlic scapes and, yeah. and find this out. But that's what it is. You want to cut that at the injunction of where it's coming out of the plant. So when you do that, what you want to do is, yeah, you want to cut them. And so what that does essentially is plants, uh, any plant is designed to reproduce. So when it puts that scape on, it's starting to put its energy into that notch, which would be the seed pod. And so it's decided, okay, now I'm ready to reproduce. So when you cut that scape, it's going to put its energy back into the bulb and the growth as opposed to putting to the scape. Now, you can do a couple of things with these scapes. Don't throw them in your compost pile. Uh, Some of these major garlic gardeners will sell these to specialty restaurants because it's a two-week span a year. You can can just fry the garlic scape on the grill. You can make garlic scape pesto. You have to really like garlic because it is a very good... I mean, you can cut it. It's it's very strong garlic flavor. You can cut it with uh, basil or spinach or kale, but it is um, definitely, if you just make the garlic scape pesto, it's, it's quite strong, so you... Um, but you could instead of just making instead of making the pesto, you could grind it with some olive oil and then freeze it, and that way you have and you freeze it in small portions, and you can add that when you cook. It's really good that way. We've also dehydrated it and ground it to a powder and use it as a seasoning, uh, and it has just, just same thing as a garlic. Or you can chop yeah. it up um, into smaller portions and use it in stir fry. So that's that'll be about four to five weeks before you're going to harvest, and based on your variety, you're going to harvest between the third week in June here in Milwaukee to the second week in July. You'll know when it's time to harvest when the bottom two sets of leaves die off and the top of the plant is still 
completely green. That's your indication to harvest. You're wanting to dig those plants out, not pull them out, because you will extract, you, you will rip the stalk out of the bulb, and you want that uh, in its entirety to dry to allow the juices from the top of the plant to, to, grow, to go back down into the bulb. You're going to hang it ho- uh, vertical and let gravity pull that energy back into the bulb. You let it cure for four to five weeks uh, in an in a air circulated room, a, a ease of a porch, a garage, somewhere where it's not going to get direct sunlight or moisture. Trim the tops off about two inches above the bulb, and you can store it for seven to nine months. And uh, that's just a little bit of how you can grow garlic. There's a number of videos on our website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com, that indicates that gives much more detail. And, and when you come to our garlic talks, which you can find under the Come See Us tab, we've got more information there as well. So hopefully you will look at possibly growing garlic in your garden this year because it's something that once you've grown it once, you'll never, you'll wonder why you didn't grow it sooner. When we come back, Holly's going to take over and uh, I'll assist her on this. Some of the most common garden, or some of the most common canning mistakes new beginners make right after this. Have a gardening question? Email Joey and Holly at twvgradio at gmail.com. The River West Co-op Grocery and Cafe is proud to support the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener and a lot of other Wisconsin growers as well. The Co-op offers a wide range of local and organic produce in their store and on their cafe menu, from apples to yogurt and everything in between. Open 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. weekdays, 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. weekends at the corner of Clark and Frackney in Milwaukee's River West neighborhood. See what is in store and check out the Co-op Cafe delicious vegetarian menu at riverwestcoop.org. Garden seeds do not have to cost a fortune. Just 99 cents at migardener.com. With over 300 varieties of non-GMO, heirloom and organic, flower, vegetable and herb seeds available year-round, pay less and get more seeds. Shipping as low as $2.50. That just makes sense. Go to migardener.com for seeds and gardening needs, tools and special blend fertilizer. migardener.com. It's that simple. Family owned and operated. Do you have a problem with deer or small herbivores eating your vegetation? There is a natural solution that is safe for your pets and family. BobX is the answer. An environmentally friendly solution to protect your plants will not wash off and is guaranteed. BobX deer was independently tested against nine known competitors and rated 93% effective, second only to a physical barrier. BobX can be used on all types of ornamentals, trees, and shrubs. I support by name at your local independent garden center. find out more, visit BobX.com. B-O-B-B-E. Hi, I'm John Lewandowski, Retail Manager of Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center. Now, I'm not going to tell you about our awesome dome-grown plants, our beautiful pottery, or our 40 varieties of landscape materials. What I am going to tell you is that Blue Mel's is a local, independent, family-owned garden center that truly cares about your garden or landscape project. So if you're looking for that one garden center that actually cares about you, come to Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center. We've been treating our customers like family since 1955. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your host, Joey Holly Baird. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show on 860 AM WNOV and W293CX106.5. Thank you very much for joining us this Saturday morning. And... We are in the midst of September, but we still have some fresh produce coming from Georgia, as well as some uh, Michigan blueberries and uh, pecans. Right. If you like fresh produce delivered right to your neighborhood, you should check out check out Tree Rep Citrus Company. You can find out where to pick up the top quality produce from tree-ripe.com. They have tasty peaches, sweet, juicy blueberries, just not even comparable to what you can find in your grocery store. They come right to a stop in your neighborhood, local farmer's markets. They have smaller portions. You can find out more at tree-ripe.com. They have locations all over, including Iowa, Upper Lower Michigan, Minnesota, Illinois, and, of course, right here in Wisconsin. And in the winter, they have citrus and something else. I think just citrus. Citrus, yeah. Yeah. So tree-ripe.com is your go-to for the freshest produce around. Yeah, you can go and find out where they're going to be in your neighborhood and find out uh, some other information about what they have year-round and 
uh, check them, them out. Well, here, let's talk about this. Everybody, you know, we go, we, you do a lot of canning classes or canning, well, they're, they're canning classes, instructional basics of canning classes, and people will ask questions and because they don't know. And some people don't ask questions, and they go ahead and proceed with the, what they believe is the correct way to do something because they've either seen it, heard it, or read about it, but that doesn't always mean it's correct. So we're going to talk about five, the biggest five mistakes that we feel many canners, beginner canners, or somebody, sometimes advanced canners make just because they are not instructed to do well. Now, again, canning is a science. You do not do canning right. There are repercussions in which you, which you can be sick or you can actually die from diseases such as botulism. Right. So we're not trying to scare you, but canning is, you need to be safe. You can't take shortcuts like you can in, gar- in gardening. Canning, you've got to do X, Y, Z, the way it's done, the way it's And just to be because done. you saw somebody on Facebook do it doesn't mean that it's right. You have to understand that it is a process, as Joey mentioned, it is a science and you are taking your own health and life at stake, too. Not trying to scare you, just just a reminder. No, we have 43 videos on our website and, and YouTube channel about basic or about canning what you grow. We uh, Holly instructs it in very detail. This is what I'm doing, and this is why you need to do it. It's not just, okay, just follow what I do, and I'm not going to explain anything. So let's go over the five things here in which uh, people most commonly do wrong. So I think we covered uh, number two about unsafe canning. You want to make sure that you are canning safely. So let's go to number one, um, not reading the recipe. So you may get a recipe and you're like, okay, I'm going to make this tonight. And you might have to find out that you need to soak something for three hours. Or 24 hours. Or 24 hours. hours. Yeah. Or you might realize that you don't have uh, enough sugar or lemon juice or vinegar or something like that. So you want to plan ahead. Don't just say, okay, well, I need three cups. I've got a cup and a half. Good enough. Let's make this happen because that's going to disrupt the whole chemical process in which the canning or the pickling or the procedure that you're going to go about doing, it's not going to, the end result will be wrong and could be unsafe to consume that, that, that food. Right. So then, so that's one thing. You want to use a reliable recipe. So that would include something that's been published within the past uh, 10 to 15 years. Just because grandma's soup tastes, you might think tastes really good in a can, you don't want to can that and be unsafe and possibly get very sick. Now, what if you want to take that recipe that of your great grandmother's? Is there somewhere in which I can take that and go, this is, was published in 1923. Can you verify that this is safe or what can be done to make this safe that I can do it today to carry on that grandma did this the way I remember it? Sure. So we have, um, and we had Christina Ward on here. She's a master canner food preserver for milwaukee county you could reach out to her you could take any of her classes through the milwaukee rec department she's got classes there Um, otherwise you could um, reach out to look online at the national center for home food preservation there's a lot of guides there ball canning which is pressedpreserving.com there's some different information there as well. So and, and you can always reach out to us at TWVG Radio and we can at, at gmail.com, mm-hmm. and, and we can get you in contact with these people in order to make sure you're doing it safely. So you want to check your jars. Your jars, these are, first of all, you want to use the right jars, which would be mason jars. You don't want to use some old mayonnaise jar, spaghetti sauce jar, or mustard jar, what have you, you want to make sure you A couple you reasons why you don't want to do that. For one, um, mason jars are made to withstand the heat from the different canning processes, and they're made to be reused over and over again. We're talking about the clear glass jars, not the old blue jars like we talked about a couple weeks ago. Um, then you want to check the rims <coughs> because there could be like a little divot in the rim. Just don't grind your finger on it. Gently touch. You'll see if there's little notches taken out of the actual top portion of the jar itself because that's important because there's a rubber gasket on these lids that have to seal to that glass and if there's a uh, a divot or a chunk missing there's not going to be a seal there and it will not seal and it won't be able to be shelf stable definitely so you want that seal to to happen um now and as i had mentioned you you don't want to believe everything you see so if your friend is canning in baby food jars don't say that's the wrong way to can. You're going to die. But just don't can in baby food jars. Like, I, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, people will try to take shortcuts to save a few dollars. 
uh, when you could spend the couple of dollars that you need for the proper equipment to do it safe, to do it right, because, um, and you can take this however you want. Some people are luckier than others, if you want to believe in luck. Uh, and some people will do this over and over again and never get sick. And I've done this for 83 years, and, and then somebody else will do it one time, and, and that's the end of it. Right. Uh, and so if you, not to scare you, but a lot of people think, oh, botulism, that's like from before the 90s. Nobody gets botulism 2014. Anymore. But, yeah, uh, I think it's 2014. There was a case of it in Colorado where people did die. Yeah. Uh, it was a potluck, and they gave improper canning they brought improper canned goods Mm -hmm. and a bunch of people got sick and i I, yeah i think a couple people died from it so you don't want to do that and uh let wrong canning methods so there is um low acid canning and then i guess you would call it high acid canning so low acid canning is the pressure canner that's where the canner gets to a higher temperature and then water bath canning or boiling water canning is where the temperature is uh, still at boiling, but it's you don't you don't have to have that hot temperature for the low acid foods. Uh, real briefly, for those who missed that segment a couple of weeks ago, what are some of the items in which you can safely, if done, follow the directions uh, correctly in water bath versus pressure canning? Sure. So you can can a lot of things in the water bath, amazingly, but you have to add a lot of times some acid or some sugar. So. Uh, tomatoes are great. Tomato things like pasta sauce, salsa, tomato juice, tomato soup, all of those uh, ketchup, great things for the water bath canner. But you're again, you're adding some either some sugar or some acid to to those. make that shelf stable and right. safe. And when I say acid, I don't mean literal acid. I mean something like vinegar or lemon juice is what you're adding to it. And then the pressure canning is a totally different method, but right, there but are okay. So other things you can water bath can are jams and jellies. Uh, chutneys, preserves, marmalades, so anything like that kind of type of thing, salsa. Um, Would you say there's more things that you can can in water bath than you... I think like if you're looking for more combined food items, okay. everyday food items, like like salsa, pasta sauce, a lot of those things that you might, that might kind of stack up on your grocery bill, that you're going to save time canning yourself, and, and then pressure or can- save money. Then pressure canning, uh, the items are different, and the procedure in which you can them are a completely night and day different. Pr- right. Way so to other go. things you can water bath can would include. Um, we did this mock pineapple with uh, zucchini, and so you can do fruits in in the water bath juices canner. as well, and juices as well. So that's. Another bonus, and then any kind of pickled item, pickled vegetables. Okay, let's talk. Let's name a couple of here off the pressure canning list because this is something. If and and, and we're kind of getting into mistakes, some people will jump right into the pressure canner and go, "Okay, I'm just going to pressure can all this stuff." And as an instructor of basic canning, you would instruct people if you're going to do canning, that's great, but start off simple. Water bath is the most affordable it, and it gives you the basic easiest. concepts of canning so it's kind of like if you're baking are you gonna if you're gonna start baking are you going to bake a five layer cake and decorate it all at the same time no you're not going to do that so you start small and you think about how much you actually want to invest what if you start canning you absolutely hate it and you're just like this is for the birds I can't and you've stand already spent 300 bucks yeah, yeah you don't do that so start small try, you know find some jars get yourself going and then determine if that's something you want to do because it is work but the payoff is in winter you can open up a can of something. And, and if you don't want to spend any money, go to find somebody in your church, your, your your group that you go to every week, a friend who does can, and say, hey, when you can, can I just sit in on you? I'll help you cut some stuff, peel some stuff, just so I can see what I might be getting into if I decide to take this step in preserving what I'm growing or, or buying at the grocery store. Right. So with that being said, just make sure that you are being safe. If it seems unsafe, if it seems weird or strange or sketchy, it doesn't seem right. Don't, <laughs> don't do it, and always plan ahead. And if you are going to start canning, definitely think about um, starting small. So, with that being said, uh, when some people have large lawns, some people have small lawns, some people don't like cutting grass. I know your sister's in that category. I don't know why it's it's really not that bad of a thing. Uh, but if you have good equipment, you can cut your grass, do it right. And have a reliable piece of equipment, and Aaron's can help you out with that. Yep, that's right. So do you hear that? That's your neighbor shaking in their grass-stained shoes because Aaron's is about to help you step up your grass-cutting game. Your name is on the mailbox, so Aaron's name should be on your mower. Heavy-duty steel construction, smarter, smoother controls, professional cutting performance. The only thing we love more than the smell of freshly cut grass is a sweet taste of victory. Aaron's, it comes down to this. Visit aarons.com to find your local dealer 
for lawn and snow removal equipment. When we come back, we're going to go to Al- uh, Alberta, Canada, where? We're going to talk to Donna Balzer. As she's a horticulturist, motivational speaker, and author. And we're going to get some tips on how to better our garden for this year and next, right after this. Tweet Joey and Holly using hashtag TWVG. Oh, yeah. What you say? You say Nasala Kombucha. It'll put some glide in your stride and still step. Nasala Kombucha. <laughs> yeah. Nasala Kombucha makes your body happy. I have a growing family and I try to make healthy meals. And one thing I really love about Woodman's is that they have a huge selection of fresh fruits and vegetables. And the quality is really good too. They even carry locally grown produce. And they keep the prices low. So I can stay within my budget and put a healthy meal on the table. I'm Cameron. And this is my Woodman's. Hot Shen Mill, 125 years of experience producing stone, ground, organic flour and cornmeal made from premium quality whole grains. Family owned company, continual standards that are non-GMO, organic at the highest safety levels. Offering a wide variety of flours, pasta, baking mixes, flaxseed and more. Even kosher and gluten free options. Found at most local grocers like Woodman's. For more information and recipes, visit hotshinmill.com. That's H-O-D-G-S-O-N-M-I-L-L.com. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, rootmaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants to multiple gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. Rootmaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit Rootmaker.com. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. That's me and that's Holly over there. It's the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show on 860 AM WNOV and W293CX106.5. Thank you very much. Where's Holly? Who's Holly? You, you're Holly. Oh, I'm Holly? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we went over this with rehearsal. I don't know where. Oh, yeah. Well, you must not have been there. Okay. Uh, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com is your destination for over 1,000 garden video, short and long format, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and a whole lot more that you can check out. You can also check out on September the 16th, you can go to Blue Mills for their 7th annual Customer Appreciation Fall Festival gathering there. It's a Saturday from 10 to 1. They're going to have brats and food. You can check out all their fall festival items. Their pumpkins all the gourds. fall fun things. Uh, the pumpkins, the gourds, the bulbs. The, I think they're going to have some the hot mums. dogs. Yeah, the brats there, brats, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we will be there about 1030, and uh, you can come see us as well. So you can find that at 4930 West Loomis Road in Greenfield, just south of Layton. And you can go to bluemills.com or call 414-282-4220. Yep, there you go. Check them out. And uh, the official garden center of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Well, Holly, let's go to uh, Canada to bring in our next guest. So we have the horticulture speaker and author, hosts a radio show on CBC in Alberta. Years, she's years of hosting my H on my my HGTV show, um, was on Bug, Bugs and Blooms on HGTV. And she helps gardeners grow and beginners blossom. No seed left behind, no soil un turned and no guff gardening welcome to the show donna balzer hey hi there hey well appreciate you taking time out of your uh, your day there in canada i know you're on the uh pacific time zone there and you got up a little early to join us uh, holly myself and our <laughs> listeners and we thank you for that well thank you well let's talk about this you you're an author of no guff gardening there's there's three points that i want to cover with you and, and this will help all of us out here beginners and advanced gardeners uh, schedule shelter and soil let's talk about shelter first people think uh well the soil can be worked that's what the back of the seed packet says let's just throw the seeds in the ground and that's not always the case so you're talking about shelter first uh, uh, um, schedule first people want to put the seed, put the seeds in the ground right away and that's not always the best thing for them right i think exactly like in the spring when it's cold in the soil 
it takes the seeds a lot longer to germinate, and some seeds just won't do it, and that's why you see some seeds look pink. They've been they've been treated with a pesticide so that they can fight off the bad guys while they're waiting to germinate because it's just too cold. So here's the ideal thing. We're talking about fall right now. We just, we're in September 2nd. There are so many seeds that you can plant right now because right now, guess what? The soil is really warm. It's been spending all summer warming up with all that sun. So right now is the best time to plant some of those fall things. And I learned that by accident. I learned that you could plant your, um, your spinach, for instance, right now. Have you done that yourself? Oh uh, no, we we have not done that. We are uh, we did get some lettuce in the ground a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. Well, spinach is something that I learned by accident as it reseeded itself in my garden because I was lazy. I forgot to cut back the seed heads after it went to bloom, and all of a sudden, uh, the ones that came up in the fall over winter, but better yet, the others came up randomly in the spring and I just love that because then I had a really, really early crop. I would never think to plant seeds that early. I just wouldn't have scheduled it that way. Other things that can be planted in the fall, as you suggested, are lettuce and mustard greens. And I've even had good luck with radishes. Yeah. A lot of plants won't grow until it's, you know, the daylight starts to get shorter. We need to say that because that's happening. Um, but, you know, in Milwaukee, where you are, the days don't get down to 10 hour length until, oh, November 7th. So you've got all of September and all of October. Even though it's cool, these cups can grow in cool weather. So get them started now. I think it's a mistake to wait. And I think it's a mistake to only put in the one crop in the spring and then say, well, I'm done now. We're all done. Right. Well, let's, let's talk about, since we talked about schedule, let's talk about uh, shelter because people think, well, in Milwaukee, if it's cold outside and there's snow on the ground, we're done. But if you plan ahead, you can garden a lot of times almost all year through just with a little shelter. Yes, yes that's for sure. And, again, that people think of this as cold shelter for the spring. So they'll put in a cold frame, which is just a little structure that looks it's just got either a glass top or a plastic top, maybe some size. And you just plant into that and leave the lid down and that keeps it cozy. Or you can use a product called Rene, it's also called Fun Bond Polyester, or just even Row Cover. That is a very light fabric, but it comes in different lengths. You can buy it by the, you know, by the yard, get a cut to the right piece, lay it right over the crop, and it does give you some, some frost shelter, so it'll keep snow off, it'll keep those early frosts off. But again, I'm only talking about planting those really frost tolerant plants in the fall, so, so something like a row cover or a, you know, a little uh, cold frame will really do a lot to help you. But I think um, another thing people don't think about is in-ground table feeding, and that's kind of an odd thing, kind of an extreme thing, but I was visiting with a, a farmer, and he uses that in his ground. Have you ever seen that electrical table that people use in the fall? Right. Right. That can actually keep the soil quite a bit warmer. And he found that uh, he was able, because he used it in the spring to an earlier crop growing, so he just normally wasn't, he was so far north, he's out in Edmonton, he just was not normally able to grow things like cantaloupe, so he just couldn't, wouldn't get warm enough. So, you know, though that's an extreme measure, but the, the easier method is just to use the row cover, the closed row cover, or the, you know, or the cold fridge. Okay, so let's talk about soil. Why is soil so important? There's been so much misconception around soil. It's just ongoing misconception. People think if you just add a bit of compost, you're okay. But you know the old saying, garbage in, garbage out. If the compost isn't really up to snuff, but it doesn't have lots of um, value to it, then you're going to find out that your soil is not going to really grow. I went to a garden this summer. They had seeded the garden in early June. And it's a modest climate here. It's not bad. They had seeded in early June, and I, they phoned me, come and see our garden. It was first week of July, and their carrots were only up one inch. And I said, what, what's going on? What did you do that was different this year? And they had ordered new soil. I said, this is new soil. Usually when you order new soil, it's all primed up with fertilizer. So the story there is that they had already soil from a really poor supplier, and the soil was very, very low on nutrients. 
So if your plants aren't growing, don't blame your seeds, don't blame your stones, blame your soil. Your soil is almost always the number one reason why things aren't doing what you hope they'll do. So you need to make sure that they're well, well supplied with nutrients. Have you, have you heard of seed meals? Do you have seed meals down there? Yes, we have. Yeah. Seed meals are the number one source of nitrogen, and a lot of people don't realize they can add a seed meal directly to their compost pile. So start adding things like seed meal to your compost pile. But I have one other thing you can add to your compost pile, and that's soil. Take your best soil in your garden. So find a little patch. Just dedicate that one patch and start adding that in small increments to your soil as you build your compost. Because the microorganisms in that soil will help to hold the nitrogen as the seed meal releases it to the microorganisms, to the microbes, that soil will help to hold it right in your compost. So that can really help you produce better compost because if you just add the compost you're already making, there's a good chance it's not going to be strong enough. The plants aren't going to grow well enough. So soil is so important. If anything at all is going wrong, for instance, I have people that come over and they say to me, I can't believe you're growing cabbages. I say, well, what do you mean? Why would, why would they grow cabbages? Well, because most people have turned away from cauliflowers, cabbage, broccoli, because they don't want to bite into big bugs, you know, those big cabbage worms when they bring them in the house. But if your soils are up to snuff, if you've got all of your minerals balanced in your soil, you actually will find that you're not going to have a lot of insect problems. And that surprises most people. You don't have to cover them. A lot of people think you have to cover your crops to keep the, um, the cauliflower worms out. But no, the secret is you don't have to cover them. You just have to have good mineralized soil. And even though I did not write this book, I'm going to suggest a book for your readers. It's um, Steve Solomon's Intelligent Gardener. And that is a book everyone can spend to read this fall and winter because it will help you improve your soil doesn't matter where you are. If you can improve your soil, you do not have to worry about bugs. You do not have to worry about slow plant growth. You can just carry on with your gardening, weeding, planting, and thinning. The, the jobs we like to do, you don't have to be so worried if you've got your soil up. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, all of our gardens are different year to year. And, and what is a problem that you faced in your garden this year? And how did you deal with that uh, going forward? And I, I, I'm going to guess one of them was raspberries. And was there other problems you had in your garden this year? Huh. Yeah, yeah. Last year we took out our irrigation system because it just wasn't working. Uh, it was an old system put in before our time. And we finally took it out and we saw it. Big plans in the spring to rebuild that irrigation system. Well, you know, we didn't get to it. So <laughs> all of a sudden... Uh, you'll see that on my blog, uh, donnabalter.com, there. There's a little video I made. All of a sudden, we had a real heat stroke, and so we had no moisture at all. Raspberries need to have moisture. And the one detail I didn't realize about raspberries is that they prefer shade, at least a little bit of shade, a little bit of overhead cover. And I've only grown raspberries once before, even though I was 30 some year gardener, because I grew them by accident in my old house. They grew in from the neighbors. They were in the partial shade. They were fine. So here I am in a double whammy situation. I mean, it's full sun. It's an extreme heat wave, and I don't have any way of watering these raspberries. So they were just miserable for me this year. So remind people if they're starting a new raspberry patch to look for a place that has a little bit of a little bit of shade. And make sure that if you're running into some heat, that you need to look at a way to water them. We just didn't have that worked out. We're working on it now. It's too late for this summer, but it should be great. We had to drag some very long holes over, and, and they'd really rebound it, but it's too late to produce raspberries because I've been early. I've been early blooming raspberries here. So the other the other thing I have a problem with, um, I, have, I seem to have a problem in my in my cantaloupe this year, and it's my third year of growing cantaloupe. And they have been amazing every year. And I was doing a little bit of extra research, and I realized I am in a sandy soil. I don't know if anyone in Milwaukee has a sandy soil. The sandy soils just don't hold the micronutrients. So even though I had been adding the other nutrients I needed and building my soil, the micronutrients have to be sprayed on because they get lost in the sandy soil. They just get watered out. So just a couple of days ago, I sprayed my... All of my crops, like zucchinis and pumpkins and squash and cantaloupes, 
I sprayed them with a zinc phosphate, and that's one gallon, or sorry, zinc sulfate, one tablespoon per gallon of water, and you just put them in the sprayer and spray it on the leaves, and that just feeds that micronutrient. It was really short. So you could see the um, early stages of powdery mildew, and those are the times that you were, that you were short on the zinc. And that's a very odd thing. I mean, most people wouldn't realize that. Right. Powdery mildew signs are a sign that you're short on things. So I, I had to do that. But, you know, you could be short on other smaller nutrients. You could be short on boron. If you have a crop that, you know, your cabbage are brown in the middle or your, even your cauliflower is a bit brown, you could be short on boron. And that's, again, as easy as spraying it on. The trouble is boron doesn't go through the leaves. It only goes directly into the soil. So you have to spray the boron right onto the soil, and that helps. Well, let's talk about your book, No Guff Gardening. Uh, you uh, had a co-writer. You, you two worked together on this. Uh, where can people find it, and what is the big uh, thing you want people to know about the book before they purchase it? Well, No Guff Vegetable Gardening, you can get it on Amazon. You can look it up on Amazon, No Guff Vegetable Gardening. You left out that one word, and I can realize that at first. That can be bought on Amazon, but I can also sell it direct off my webpage, so you can look at com. But I really like about the book, and, I, and people say again and again and again, it's good for the whole family because the illustrator, Mariko, is, well, she's hilarious. She She's just drawn some very, very funny images that really bring the point to mind. For instance, at one point, her dogs were visiting my garden and they ate some of my compost. I was ready to move and I hadn't finished making compost, so I dumped it out onto my garden thinking, you know, it's really, as I said, garbage and garbage out. That compost was garbage. It wasn't finished yet. I spread it out in my garden. Her dogs came and ate it because they're just garbage dogs and it cost her $3,000. So Mariko, uh, in her little sense of humor, drew a little ambulance on the page of compost. Just, you know, just a small warning. So she's done some very hilarious things. We have really, um, it'll walk people that are starting vegetable gardening, that want to know some of these basics, it'll walk them through. But it's also very entertaining. I had a lady who, who had a two-year-old who said it was her two-year-old's favorite book, and I thought, well, I could be insulted by that, but actually it's true. It's a very colorful and bright book. Well, Donna, we greatly appreciate you taking time out of your day to share some of your garden knowledge with Holly, myself, and all of our listeners. All right. Thank you for calling. Thank you, Donna. Yeah. And we'll be right back after this with your garden questions and our garden answers. If you have a gardening question, you can call into the ivorganic.com hotline at 414-444-5250 right now. Do you have a little space to grow? Check out Greenstock Vertical Gardens at greenstockgarden.com. Greenstock is engineered to grow with its innovative space and water-saving design. You can grow vegetables, flowers, herbs, and even strawberries in just two square feet of space. Grow up instead of out. Perfect for the porch, patio, or deck. Grow up to 30 plants in a small space. Greenstockgarden.com has everything you need to grow in the littlest of spaces. Proudly made in the USA. For more information and to purchase, visit GreenstockGarden.com. Beans and Barley Marketing Cafe, a neighborhood specialty grocery store for the East Side of the Greater Milwaukee area, where you can find all you need from fresh produce to bakery to organic frozen dinners, from wine to fresh squeezed carrot juice. The health food store has hundreds of products, vitamin supplements, bath and body items, magazines, cars, books, and a knowledgeable staff. Catering available, open daily at 8 a.m. The restaurant serves breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week with a menu of good, healthy, homemade food, including vegetarian and non vegetarian. garden center that listens to and understands my needs. I want to buy my gardening products from a local business with strong ties to the community. All I want is a garden center that truly values their customers. It seems like everyone is selling plants these days, but I'm having a hard time finding quality. I take pride in my garden, so I want my garden center to take pride in their products. Where will you be going for all of your gardening needs this season? 
Blue Mel's Garden Center. We are your answer. Blue Mel's 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. Now back to two gardeners who understand where you're coming from. We understand gardening can be difficult at times. But you really get the reward when you put all that hard work in and then you get to reap the benefit of the harvest. And sometimes it's not even a lot of hard work. Joey and Holly Baird. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show on 860 AM WNOV and W293CX106.5. Sometimes it's no work and sometimes it's a lot of work and sometimes it's just disappointment. That's just the way gardening is. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com is your destination for 1,000 plus garden videos, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and a whole lot of more on that website, as well as you can contact us. Uh, if you have a question on the Ivy Organics dot com three in one plant guard hotline, and how do we do that, Holly? Ivy Organic three in one plant guard naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents. Protects newly installed plants and trees, shields pruned and damaged surfaces for use on your roses, fruit, and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. This product is non toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, visit ivyorganics dot com. You can feel free to call in to four one four 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 fifty two fifty. Um, so let's see, we had well, some and, questions. And if you don't want to call in and you just want to send us an email, you can do that at twvgradio at gmail.com, or you can also just tweet us using hashtag TWVG. We had a number of questions, like you were saying there, that came in through social media, email all this week. So um, what do we got? What do we uh, have? Okay, the, so uh, let's see here. Um, I use organic potatoes out of the shop, let them seed them plant some of the plants are all plant and no potatoes do you ever have to cut the tops like tomatoes to stop this from happening no typically you want to if you're going to get potatoes and grow them from your garden or from the shop from the organic garden uh, shop most times they will grow just fine sometimes you do want to uh, make sure you have certified seed potatoes so you don't have any problems with that but uh, most times if they're sprouting in your cupboard you can go ahead and plant them in the ground, but you don't want to snip that green or the, the growth portion off. Uh, but that's something you can think about in the spring. Uh, here's one for you. Is it safe to can leftover cooked vegetables? If it is, how long and, and how do you do that? And is that safe canning? No, um, that's not safe. And the reason being is that there's so many variables there. Um, what kind of vegetables? Uh, vegetables, when you can them in the pressure canner, can at different times. So if it's like a mixed vegetable, you might not be efficiently canning them. Also, it depends on how cooked they are. Most time when you cook vegetables, they're already soft. If you were to can them, they'd probably just get mushy and nasty. So if you have extra vegetables or any extra leftovers and it's not going to be safe to can, it's good to freeze it. You know, sometimes if I make too much of one thing, I'll freeze it and then use it for later use. So definitely not a good idea. And we do get not so much questions, but comments uh, in regards to past segments on the program uh, in reference to the segment on fermentation a few weeks back, the, the comment was, I love the topic. I've been making my own fermentation items uh, for a homemade, homemade yogurt and kombucha for about four years now. Nothing compares to it, so they wanted to express their love for the uh, homemade. Um, Real quick, what is fermentation so for people who maybe missed sure, that or so don't it's, know? Um, basically a process of using good bacteria to uh, change the chemical properties of a food for storage or for benefit. It's not a canning procedure. No. And you don't have to have any special equipment to do this. Right. And the only, some people are like, oh, my neighbor f- makes beer. Is that fermentation? Yes, it's fermentation. But there's other non-alcoholic edible items that you can make uh, with fermentation. So then let's see here. Okay, so we dehydrated cucumbers. Um, we've been kind of playing around with this. It's kind of fun. But why do we dehydrate the cucumbers? Oh, uh, we had a lot of cucumbers. Uh, sometimes we have the cucumbers, and you've all been here if you've grown cucumbers. Uh, you've missed one, and it's really, really big and starting to change color. And it's real bitter when you try to eat it. So what we've done is we've sliced them or, or about a, half, a quarter inch thick and then put them on the dehydrator. And dehydrate them, they take based on the thickness and the moisture content, you know, 12, 14 hours. And they taste fine once they're dehydrated. It, it almost seems like the bitterness has been extracted from them. Yeah. And then you can use them. So then what we... Well, There's a couple of things we're going to try to do with so them. So what are you going to do, Joy? Uh, we're going to use them for dehydrated cucumbers, and we're going to throw them in a pitcher of water and turn them into cucumber water. They'll rehydrate and emit their their fragrance or the, the taste, their taste yeah, into the water. Taste. Yeah. 
cucumber water is very good for you. And then we, the second time we dehydrate them now, we put dill on them. Well, it's not the dill seed. It's dill weed. Dill weed. Yeah, mm-hmm. we ground up dill. Uh, let it dehyd- We dehydrate the dill and then ground it up to a powder form. Yeah, and just like dill weed, you buy and sprinkle it on the, on the plants. Right. Start, sprinkle it on the cucumbers before we start to dehydrate. So it. we're gonna. So they're pretty good. They're, they taste kind of like a pickle without the. It's a dehydrated the, pickle. Kind of, yeah. So we'll have to try that. See what else we can maybe put on the cucumbers, and so it's like a, a cucumber chip almost. And we've also been dehydrating tomatoes as well, uh, and the, essentially they're sun-dried tomatoes, basically without the sun portion of it. They. You dry them out, and then you store them, dry storage, and use them for a variety of different dishes throughout the winter months. So, yeah, try to, uh, you know, we have a lot of pickles, so we decided to try something new. Yeah, and uh, we might, uh, we uh, we also, we, we've grown okra like William Moss uh, had instructed us to do. The, the okra is doing phenomenal in the garden right now, and we dehydrated some okra pods, chopped them up, and, and then sprinkled dill on them. They're really good. They don't have that greasy texture that, you know, that sliminess that you think okra has. And I think they, they you really don't know it's okra. I haven't tried them no, yet. No, you haven't tried them yet. And I'm sure you would have already I voiced will. your opinion if you would have tried them. I know. I, I should have, so I could tell you my opinion. Uh, um, so what is the best time to plant sweet potatoes, Joey? Uh, sweet potatoes are best planted. Well, they're only going to grow if you plant them in the spring. If you plant them now, they're not going to happen. But in the spring, you can plant your sweet potatoes in a very warm, sunny spot. They do really good in the south because the south has more poor soil, and they like that poor soil. Um, We've got a poor spot in your sister's backyard that they're doing really well. You want to plant the slips, and the way you acquire the slips are, well, you can buy them online or at garden centers, or you can just take a sweet potato, uh, cut uh, the bottom off of it, Set it in water with toothpick so it's uh, got the bottom two inches uh, soaking in water. It'll develop roots and begin to grow top sprouts out of it. Pinch those top sprouts off. Put those in water for about a week. They'll root, and then you just put those right in the ground. Uh, easy way to do. Uh, you want to do an organic sweet potato, uh, preferably. Uh, that's the best way to start your spe- sweet potatoes uh, sprout or sweet potato uh, If you have plant. kids, this would be cool for them to see. You just put this potato in the water, and um, or even a school project. Yeah, or a school project. So, even if you maybe you're not going to plant the the potato like a school project, you could just see how it vines and grows. And some dishes, sweet potato leaves are uh, an uh, uh, important di- uh, item in the dish. So those are also edible, as well. All right. So I want to plant garlic this fall in my container garden during the coldest months of the winter, which are. Did we, did we ask this last week? Yeah, we asked that one last did week. Did we? Yeah, I didn't. We we had one that came in from a listener in Michigan. Oh, uh, this morning about the tomatoes. The, the tomatoes. Okay, so the tomatoes, a lot of times we'll, we'll see this too, where the skin kind of cracks like at the shoulders or on the top where, of the where tomatoes. the tomato connects to the actual plant, Those the top portion is called the shoulders, and it's cracking, and he, he they really like to give them away to friends and family, but they don't want to because they're ugly tomatoes. Uh, what can he do differently to get those to quit cracking? Well, a couple of things. One, if, uh, don't be giving stuff away if, if you like it. <laughs> uh, secondly, there are some varieties of tomatoes, heirloom and uh, heirloom varieties that are naturally that naturally crack. Secondly, if you're inconsistent watering, too much water at one time, the plant will suck all of it up and then try to grow the internal portions of the tomato much quicker than the outer portions, and your skin will crack beginning at the top, and sometimes too much, it'll just blow and sometimes, it. Yeah, sometimes it'll just split open. Split completely mm-hmm. open. So that's another thing. But uh, consistent watering, good nutrients, but some varieties are just more susceptible to cracking on the shoulder portions of the tomato than others. So uh, we appreciate the, the listener from Michigan asking that question and uh, going uh, far beyond to listen to our program. And when it comes to... Uh, garden questions again anytime feel free to send us an email at twvgradio at gmail.com uh we'll, and, and if we don't know the answer we like a canning question we may not know the answer you've got you can get a hold of christina ward and get an answer the right answer not just an answer the right answer to uh get the information to the right we definitely want to give you the correct answer otherwise we would just make some stuff up and tell you so we want you to be equally knowledgeable um and make sure we're giving you correct information so with that being said this program is made possible by the, the sponsors you've heard throughout the program and you can find all of them under the radio tab on our website the wisconsin vegetable gardener.com just like nasala kombucha is the executive sponsor of the wisconsin vegetable gardener radio show 
Nestle is made in Wisconsin with local tea and natural herbs. Look for it in the refrigerator aisle at your local grocery. If you don't see it, ask for it because if it's not Nestle kombucha, it's not kombucha. Find out more at nestle.com. Miss any portion of this program or want to vi- revisit it in its entirety, you can find that under the radio tab on the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com website for full-length in-studio video and full-length podcast highlights of the show are on the right-hand side for segments and individual interviews. Programming note for next week, we're going to discuss the amount of food as a society that th- we throw out. I'm not, we're not going to blame anybody. We're just going to tell you the facts of how much we really waste here in America, as well as growing sprouts. If you've done nothing else or want to do the simplest thing, you can grow sprouts in your home all winter long. As well as Sawyer and Eric, they are from the Southeast Wisconsin Normal legislation in getting... Um, They're going to talk about the in Wisconsin here getting marijuana legalized uh, for recreational and medicinal use. So that'll be a good conversation that we will have with them. Until next week, for... Holly Baird. I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden.